philosophy, life, written by a 19 year old ish in around 1997. Forward. This book is written to help people realize how important their life really is. First, in order to care at all about what you do, you have to believe that your short time between birth and death isn't the be-all and end-all. The fact that you have a soul, which according to the revelations in the Bible, many souls of the human race will spend eternity burning in hell. If you don't believe in your soul, why should you be here and why should you give a shit about your life at all? I am not expecting to change the world, but I do expect those who read this book to listen to what it says. This may be your last chance to see clearly according to what has been said about our future and being in Africa has made me realise how close that future is. I am certainly not the only one who has tried to warn people of this. There is quite a few I know of, and will include some of their contributions, and probably lots I don't know of. To prove I am not writing this book to make money and set myself up for life, I will make no profit, and if I can find a good publisher, this book will be very cheap. <laughs> this is the first book I have written. And will definitely be and will definitely be the last. <laughs> I will not contribute anything else to the chaos of society. After this is done, I will live out my days and just watch the world, putting up with any hardship that comes my way. For I know it is the final test for this society, and my rewards will be waiting for me. I plead those who read this especially those who are close to me, to first understand. If it means reading this book over and over, then so be it. Then to react in a way which you know is right. Eternity is a long time compared with the few years you have left, whether the world blows up or not. For most people who have already worked it out, they probably do not care for the majority who put down their ways. There is no reason why they should care. I do care, and that is why I have decided to write this book and sell for a small amount of money, adding slightly to the chaos and slightly contradicting myself. I am aware of this. Also the fact that it is written on the chopped down trees causing desertification of our world. Hopefully it will do more good than harm. But that is up to the thoughts that fill your head as you read on. S. Hartley, October 1996, Fort Portal, Uganda. Two-part conversation between a psychiatrist and a patient. Shrink. Hello, sit down. Bloke. I want to know what my brain is. Shrink. Well, it's like a computer, which is programmed from birth. All you have is your character imprinted, metaphorically genetic, in your long-term memory. Bloke. What's your short-term memory? Shrink. That's where you do your day-to-day -day things. Remembering facts. Knowing the time of day. Recalling your sh list of shopping. Phone numbers, etc, etc. Bloke, what about my first language? Shrink, unless the word is connected to a long-term memory, then normal language is in short term, but because you use it so much, it continues to be stored until you die. The word love or Christmas would bring out many memories that are stored permanently in the long-term memory. Bloke, is that it? Where do dreams and visions come from? Shrink. Well, there is a lot we don't know about the brain. The long-term memory is infinite, 
so in theory wouldn't need much space. So the middle could be used for all these magical things with the power of the mind and things. Bloke. What about emotions? Shrink. It's difficult to say. It depends on your birth-given character and your experiences, but we don't know much about it. Bloke. It seems stupid that we are given this powerful brain and we can't even use it properly. You call yourself a shrink and you don't even know what your brain does. Shrink. Even if I could, there would be no way to write it. Bloke. Or go beyond words and learn it another way. You said yourself that words are short term and it's long term which is infinite. If what you do day to day is remember the words in your psychology textbook, you're not a philosopher of the mind, you're just a taxpayer. Shrink. Who are you to talk to me like that? Bloke. I'm just a thinker, living my life accordingly, and I've accomplished a hell of a lot more than you without a crappy degree. I can't tell you how to do it, or anyone, but I can just through trusting feelings and by being aware of what's happening, seeing everything as reality. There are so many different things involved that once I started, I have progressed and accelerated all the time. It was very slow to start. Shrink. What you've said makes sense with things I've heard and remind me of an article saying about children when they start school or even at the age of three can sometimes practice these mental powers to great effect. Bloke. Yes, and then they lose it, because from there, from there on, they gradually be pushed into using the short term and evading their imagination. If the child is strong in this area and is treated badly, they can do bad things, which is easier, like becoming scared, unconfident, angry. Shrink. There is a fact that with most poltergeist incidents, there has been a teenager in puberty stage and unhappy. Bloke. Everybody is able to do it. It's just probably more difficult after you've built up an ego. Shrink. So all you have to do is trust those hunches type things. Bloke. No, you have to test them first. Just watch first. And when you can read, then you can use them. We are born. That is what we know. We then learn how to use what we've got. If we were a mosquito, then we would go around using a syringe to suck blood. Not all humans use what they have got. The average human only uses 10% of his her brain in their lifetime. 90% of the brain's uses is useless. This is a lot of stuff being completely wasted and untrusted, untasted, like the petals of a rose when you've grown a thorny stick. People would be a lot happier if they learnt to use all of their brain. First of all, they would realise that they are their souls and have never been born and will never die. We know infinity exists all around us. Even our genetic code is infinite in a way, I think. Anyway, because this life has a beginning and an end, although we are not told what is after life and death, doesn't look too appealing, does not mean we are here to fill our minds with crap and do shit jobs, suck up to the boss and climb the ladder to a better standard. At the end of the day, when money loses its value, what good has it done you? And the people at the top are mostly just happy that they're not poor, but they have their fair share of grief. Life is a game. It is a game because it has a start and an end. You can quit any time. But why would you want to quit a game where you can do anything and feel any emotion? The rules are your body and brain. External rules come from other players in the game, e.g. parents, teachers, bosses. But when players restrict other players because of greed, 
You get what we have in this world, classes. This to me is bad and would be rightly revenged if people discovered their power. Make your own choices for yourself. You will one day judge yourself. Note, I would like to make a nice little living and be safe. It would please my father. How would that father feel after he had gone if the son had lost a potential full life? Worse, I wager, than if the son had gone his own way. The infinite initiative tree of knowledge, climate. S. Hartley, 996, Nairobi, Kenya. Pretend. The universe is expanding all the time, but it is slowing down. Soon it will stop and it will all come racing back to the centre. Then there will be a big bang and it will repeat the process for infinity. Why? All this is, is a playground for us, every creature. When you go to the playground, you go there to enjoy yourself. Pretend friends and pretend love aren't half as good as when they are real. Competition ends now. Memory. In one frame. Any relevant picture or sound, smell, etc. Scrolls of relevant info. Brain. Holds items longer for retracing. Short term holds seven plus or minus two items. Bypass directly into long term. Memory for rehearsed items recalled by recognition, e.g. walking, reading, will not be lost if used enough. Character implanted before birth, permanent. Long term, permanent, infinite capacity. Recall is easy once you know how. Done with relevance. Things which go straight in are memories which you learn from. Learn not about a subject, but people or animals or yourself. The brain. The outside of the brain is the bit we know about, which does all the things that we know about. We don't know very much, even how we see us humans to be far evolved, we can't even use our brains. Some people who have claimed to use more speak of telepathy and prophetizing. As I have also touched on these things, I believe these are the first to emerge. Next to come after these are the more masters I can only imagine. Part of the brain which holds 80 to 90 percent, there is all a wall surrounding which is the faith wall but once broken through brain is aware of possible power <laughs> segment cut out wall there could come to perceive what you will at will as this becomes more powerful maybe it could alter the actual reality as we know it like moving an object the skill of telepathy is not like communication but is perceiving what that person perceived, like being that person. I've only just touched on prophetizing, but as it seems to be primarily visual, with the other senses coming in later, staring at a blank wall, one might have a vision. And it's what is on mind and how the vision is interpreted by the vision holder, which is the truth of the premonition. I haven't had it so often to prove, so this is speculation on... 16th of the 9th, 96, S. Hartley. Life is a game. We people are all souls, which have set up all these planets with a big bang or whatever, and the microorganism that evolved into different beings. Anything that moves is probably used for this. 
We have separate bodies and therefore separate. We have perfect life. When we die, we just fly out and find or join the queue to another body being born. With a blockage to all memories. Apparently, it can be brought out with hypnotism, but I have not tried that yet. Also, we are all connected with each other by telepathy. If you have the competence to understand this, you could learn, teach yourself to use it. Healing powers are also available. The soul is powerful and using it is not that difficult. I myself have not used these powers myself, but I have touched on them. I believe that guardian angels are protectors to maybe important souls and maybe they are protecting them from mental telepathic harm or evil. S. Hartley My soul signature Daily Mail, Tuesday 23rd of September 1996 Parallel Universe 637 He jumped onto the ground and stumbled. They soon stalked him down and killed him. That was not the end of the war. Saddam Hussein is not the third Antichrist. This was just the beginning of the war. The third Antichrist emerged publicly. People all over the world are possessed with his look and causing anarchy in the cities and trouble everywhere else. They all seem to be Satanists, but are extremely evil and will do anything to kill someone. There is, however, another group in retaliation who say they do it for good. Yeah, it's very harsh. We have a larger group than them. They are normally one and run from anywhere and then another one comes. We've nearly killed all the fuckers in our town. We use long machetes, a shield, helmet with a spike for headbutting, and the spike out of the front and back of the foot. That statement scares me. My fear of it is that these people will want to carry on killing, and some of these people may have such a love for it that they will develop the eye of evil. People are developing this eye all the time over the world. If it does happen within groups that are fighting it, will the others want to kill them or join them? Out of fear. The whole population could get the eye. The people must have courage enough to die as yourself and not to give in to the devil. If the world ends with the remaining humans as on the devil's side, it will be a sad sight. This is not, however, our first problem. The Third Antichrist also has power in armies, alliances and nuclear weapons. This supposed fact about nuclear should not be the start of a nuclear war. If America fires first, it would be worst fate of all. At least if the Third Anti fires, Star Wars might stop it. We can't have a nuclear bomb landing on any part of our Mother Earth. This is a war of good and evil in the human soul. The leaders also must remember what this war is about. I'll be with the lakes and the hills, S. Hartley. Short film, advert. Scene 1. A man dressed in a cool suit with a cigarette in his hand walking. View from his right, across the road basically. People often say to me with disgust, Do you smoke? And I reply back to them, I just hold. <laughs> Said in a posh, pompous, arrogant, Hartley way. He then stops and takes a big drag. <laughs> then another one straight away. Blows it in an old lady's face as she walks slowly past. The man smiles with immense pleasure. There will be a bit of improvisation. <laughs> Scene 2. Set is like a news broadcaster's, with a man sitting there with some paper in his hand. He re read, This is a government information condensation film. We believe it is in the interest of the people to hold cigarettes, lit cigarettes, 
There is a team of scientists who believe there are very good medical powers that come from tobacco, and they are working on that. It is recommended to have 20 a day. It should be done anywhere, any time, regardless of no smoking, as long as you just hold. The age, lim age limit for holding is 10, but children younger can if supervised at school or with an older brother or parents. For the elders, it is good for arthritis to keep warm and a good defence for muggers. I hear you saying, how can we afford it? People who smoke always afford it. There will be in every shop cigarettes. People will be walking around with cigarettes for sale and there will be a special pack for holders, only £2.13. And that's only one pence without tax. <laughs> with 60 million people smoking 40 a day, so that's 2 times 4 times 60, 240 million pounds a day, 7 times 240 is 1,680. 1, 1 billion 680 million pounds a week and 87 billion 360 million pounds a year. Because of all this money, also with our future investment with third world countries, as they are making their fags very cheap and then just raising taxes, and they owe us quite a lot, this would be a good reason to vote for us. This is the end of the broadcast. Scene 3. The man standing out on a hill, smoking. Hark how they laugh. It's only been five years and everyone is severely addicted to nicotine. I'm not because I've always got my fags tax free and haven't changed my brand. But everyone else went for the government fags which were okay at first but declined in tar and rose in nicotine. At the moment you can buy nicotine with a syringe for an astronomical price, but the rich kids are doing it. The way it's got is if there is anyone who doesn't smoke, people will blow the smoke off their cigarette, which is very high in nicotine, into their face and get them addicted. I myself won't go near a town. If they notice that I don't smoke government fags, they'll probably stone me. The government is very rich already, Unemployment is down, the rich are richer, and the economy is good. We are not with Europe. In fact, Europe's breaking up. Sorry to tell you of your bleak future, but no one saved the world, and there was no blowing up of the world at the year 2000. The English have claimed the North Pole and plan to dig for oil in one year. Holland has had to build walls so they don't lose their country to the sea. London also has plans to do so. There is a new disease and still no cure for AIDS. The new one is apparently in the air. All seems like crap to me. Anyway, I've got a ticket off somewhere secret and I'm going to be a hermit until everyone is dead. <laughs> cool picture done in Escher style. In the middle of the world, S. Hartley, 1096, Fort Portal, Uganda. A man who has seen the light hunts to find another. He dreams of a place where these are plentiful and goes to seek and wonders at the wonders he may find. A place where the people strive to find their direction and are wise to see dead ends in a rich man's world.
Are his hopes demolished when he finds them struggling in a one-way, two-dimensional plane? He pleads for them to look around, but they are deafened by the ringing of the bells ahead of them. Are his hopes demolished when he sees those abandoning their wings to join at the back of the march, deluded by the ringing of the false promises? As he looks closer, he sees some straying, but they are beaten back into line and punished with lead soles bolted to their shoes. He wishes he could show them how to untie their laces, but still they won't hear. The only thing which doesn't hear the bells was lost long ago and will not be found over the distant horizon. He looks towards the front at the bell ringers and sees their false smile and knows there is no return. Their goal is hidden by the brink of a hill that declines with accelerating steepness, from which when started they cannot stop. This march does have an end, unseen by the followers, a ghastly pit of fire which burns brighter with every new entrant. He looks back and sees some able to run. Their faces so show such hope and contentment with where their fast legs will take them, just getting nearer to the slope where their fate is of ashes, not just of body and clothes, but also their soul. He sees some fall before the slope and is pleased, but the others don't look kindly on these and stamp them into the road of dust where their bodies will die, but their souls live on. He will continue to search for others, as his path is clear and prosperous with rewards round each corner. <clears throat> My Brain as I See It Now 5.11.96 The long-term memory is very underestimated and pushed aside in each entry you are able to have all your senses recalled and feeling in the sixth sense which there normally is especially in childhood memories. I feel that with all the many emotions when they are real that they are part of the sixth sense as we call it. Sometimes an emotion can be made up, this is part of the brain's power, to be scared in love adventurous, but they are still real. When emotions are false is when someone is lying to themselves and others. This will generally cause just more negative ones. There is two ways you can use your brain at a decision junction, good or bad, right or wrong. From birth this is easy because the mind is fresh. When they get older they have a lot of advice in their heads which is probably confused. A lot of the time this leads to rebellism, which is outcasted and punished until he or she conforms. Places for non-conformists is normally in prisons or living out of society. Some politicians have even noticed they are pushing the young out of society. If these things are being seen, and the rebelling is going up, then it means to me that humans are evolving. Children will get more freedom, and maybe the six-year-old will one day say what he or she wants and develops in a way that not many will have done. When parents are seeing in the right way, they will perhaps teach their kids of these possibilities. There will be a bad stage on the earth before this evolvement will take place. There has had to be so much shit happen in our earth before this development could happen. And there will be a devastation, but hopefully enough will survive to continue the human race. Chilled. According to F.D. Wilson and Logic, it is harder for older people to see this different view of life because of their built-up ego they've had from birth. But they can go through it and correct it by watching what they do and change accordingly. Once you have got rid of false ego, you are probably ready to do what you should have at six and explore your brain. This takes patience, collectiveness and faith in your feelings. 
The Beyond Brain. The Beyond Brain has never properly been explained to people. One reason it's impossible. There is not the words to describe it. Imagination is normally discarded as a thing that only kids do. It is, however, the start of everything. When I was a young child, I had a very good imagination. I could do it very well, like dreaming or reality. Also lately, I've been doing a lot more after a dull spell, and I began to get feelings which linked me to dreams, day or night. I would get a feeling like this at particular eventful times. After I had had quite a few, I had seen how much information was withheld, but still wasn't getting it, but just knew of their power and that they would progress. I learnt from a mistake, as usual. I was having many feelings leading to ad an adventure, and I was going to Africa, so I assumed it was going to be exciting. Nearer the day, they got scary, but I thought I needed faith to go with it. But I was precautious, and I needed to be, and I nearly lost my life. When it was over, I had some very amazing strong feelings and felt enlightened. Within that event, I had future feelings, a particular destiny, and there was also another feeling, communication with whoever was there to listen, which I feel there were a couple, but one from Earth, maybe much more. I know myself you can communicate with your brain with no language problem. See the future subconsciously and tell yourself when it is relevant to what you're facing. This being trusted is very useful. I think I have saved my life more than once because of feelings. There is another way to enter this place, subconscious, by looking and listening for messages on the relevant topic, looking into water, glass bowl, crystal ball or a wall, listening to the silence. When you dream you are in another part of the brain, when REM happenings is because you are drifting off or coming to. The fact that you don't remember your dreams is because your mind is too occupied with the next day. When you are clear, when you are near the end of your a dream, you can remember that you've been dreaming all night. When it wakes you in the middle of the night, it forces you to think about it. So you remember it in first conscious, because without it being recalled, you will slip back to a deeper level. Just because the long-term memory is infinite, it probably is the link to all these amazing feelings which are sp spoilt with the words of mere English. There is much, much more. There'll always be a lifetime's worth of thoughts. After the next barrier, there'll be another. Meta. S. Hartley, West Uganda. Eleven ten ninety six, baby. In my pursuit and expanding my mind and using more of my God given brain, I have come to accept that a baby or toddler has the ability to explore these parts. Until other things are drummed into him or her and doesn't have the time to carry on looking and basically loses it all to the trials and tribulations of life as we know it. Today on a matatu, an African baby was interested in my hair and skin. I was then thinking about whether he was aware of himself, and he looked at me. In his eyes I saw and took in a hell of a lot. People reading this who don't quite know what I am talking about have to understand that to relate to this you have to have had first-hand experience in these matters. I had a close encounter with the boy's soul. And you could say from that we, we based what could have been an understanding of each other. It was understanding of each other, the start of a relationship. What I couldn't believe was that it was so easy. I saw an intelligent person and got a lot of information in a very short time. I believe this is a type of telepathy. 
where two open-minded people can start the basis for a good relationship without saying a word. It is easier with a baby because they don't have social pressures to do particular things. If I am right, which I am, this means if the children were allowed this time to use their imagination, because that's how expanding your mind can start, then by the time they are mature, they would probably have changed the world. I feel this because children naturally develop in this way, and there would be no need to force them into it, so they wouldn't rebel it. The people of this world are changing, and as they change, the change will progress with great acceleration, as with all things that are right. The potential of this, however, infinite, but this first step, although the first step was done a long ago, is the essential one, essential for our Mother Earth and the trees and animals we are responsible for. Amen. S. Hartley, Nairobi, Kenya. I would now strike that Amen, because I think Amen is some sort of Egyptian god, and we shouldn't be saying at the end of prayers. Sorry. <clears throat> Manipulation. Manipulation is something which is essential in our society to make it work. This manipulation is practiced on 99% of children, and I would say a lot of mental patients. When a child is born, it needs to learn to use its body and brain. If a child, a child, if told something by a parent, will be very open to the possibility of what they're saying is right. Where it goes wrong is from how the parents have also been through this when they were young, but have forgotten what it was actually doing. A child is naturally progressing to use its mind, and will normally go into it further than an adult is at present. The child is taught to concentrate on becoming an adult and surviving in our society. Basically, get good education for good job with good money. With this going on, all the other things on offer are neglected. Imagination is the start for children, which then with more maturity would lead them to things of great power. Some children go further than others, but because there is no way to explain with more and more responsibility and time taken on other things, these powers are normally lost. There is something to be said about young teenagers and their rebellious stage. Sometimes the child is still strong, but is being forced to move away from its powers. Most cases of poltergeists in people's homes, there has been a young, unhappy child, and definitely could be the cause of things flying around. With no negative emotions, these special powers can come out easier, but it's good things which want to be used. But when you're told that it's not there, and you must go another way, it must be very hard to feel positive. After the rebellious stage they've been forced into, they might have done enough bad things to delude them into thinking conforming is the best way. At the moment in the world, more people are not conforming, like we did a hundred years ago. This is because there is so much shit to this society. It's beginning to be seen and people are starting to think for themselves of the unknown wonders. This is how we will evolve, not as one scientist coming up with something amazing to help humans evolve, but the actual human will evolve. This manipulation goes on because the parents want their child to be comfortable in life. The poor want something better for their kids. The middle class want them to do just as well, and the rich will keep their kids rich. They say having money is what you need to have a good life, but if they actually looked at their own lives without bias, they would see that it isn't true. But because they lived a long life that way, they will be convincing themselves it's right for them and they don't have the time to look at anything else for themselves or more importantly their children. There are so many things our society has come to accept, bad things which are not necessarily supposed to happen just the amount of depressed people, so depressed that they kill themselves, not mental, just manipulated, the wrong way, or whatever has happened in their lifetime to make them want to die. 
especially seeing how our narrow society sees death as a scary inevitability. Death is inevitable, and yet we would devote our lives so we can live later when the time to live should be now. I myself come from a middle class loving family. When I was an infant I had a very good imagination and I loved life and was progressing nicely. Slowly I began to slow down and by the time I was eleven I wasn't so good anymore. Then I was rebellious and basically did not share much with my parents as I was becoming to be fully responsible. I very nearly conformed but didn't. I picked up on my brain from where I from when I was six and slowly became aware of what I should do and became happier with life and was progressing nicely. At the moment I am still doing the same but just more and more is coming to me including the feeling that there will not be an end to the way I am going. S. Hartley Beware of the witch they will come in all shapes and sizes, and there is no physical way of telling a witch. They won't do any physical harm to you, and their physical goodness is just their alibi to get away with the mental torture they impose upon people. They will get no pleasure from other people's happiness, as a good person would, but they will be filled with disgust at it. This type of person is much worse than the murderer or rapist. It is the worst type of evil. A murderer or rapist does these things because of past experience which has made them messed up in the head, possibly caused by a witch. A witch is worse because they are clued up in their mind. They know what they are doing. They are what evil is. They are also clever and will not want to be found out even by the person they impose evil upon. You might be wondering what they could possibly do to someone which is so bad. Shakespeare's Macbeth is a good example. It is a very long play about all this, so you could imagine the depth I would have to go into to explain properly what a witch actually does. In Macbeth the witches have a little bit of information which is all they need, and the rest is cleverness. Macbeth and Banquo come from a battle and they meet the witches. The witches know, coming from a win in battle, they will be in the mood for anything, even listening to a couple of witches. The witches know a little bit about Macbeth's future, which is a little promotion because of someone's death and him doing well in the battle. They say to him, You will be Lord of Chestnuts, which they know. You will be Lord of Gold, you will be King. Then they say to Banquo, You will not be King, but all your sons will. They interfere a little later, but the rest is basically down to Macbeth's mind and Banquo's. Even though they know that they are witches, anything that happens now will be affected by what the witches said. Macbeth rejects it at first, because the King is a good one. But as things lead on, women married men for power in those days, so of course the wife will hear of it and also respond. In the end, the witches have caused so much damage, but it's ha but hardly had to do much at all. And they loved every second of it. It's what they live for. They are evil people right through. The worst thing is, in this day and age, you don't know who they are, but they are around. I don't know how many, but I would expect a few in every town. Maybe a hell of a lot more who I haven't worked out yet. We'll have to remember their friends might not know about them or their families. They might know about each other, but it could be one of your own friends. They could totally mess up your life. It would never be a good friend because they can't stand people being happy inside. <laughs> they like only to harm you if they can make you mess it up for yourself. If they ever get an outside body involved, and it's not all down to you, they will suffer for it f from their own kind. Evil people being punished by evil people. 
It's all in their head, but it's real. When you make a witch do this, you have won the battle. It's quite likely they will even die. Then of course they really choke because they burn in hell. Being happy is... Beware of the witch, continued. When you make a witch do this, you have won the battle. It is quite likely they will even die. Then of course they really choke because they burn in hell. Being happy is basically how you beat them. It drives them out of control. But don't think they can't laugh and act happy. They pride themselves on how happy they can look while they're bursting with evil inside. As an immortal soul, the idea is to build yourself and to be all negative won't work. Happy people should make more happy people. If happy makes evil person sad and sad makes evil happy, it doesn't have that infinity. It won't work because you need sad first to make happy. Which sounds like a lot of bullshit we get in our society, like no pain, no gain bullshit. As an immortal soul, life can be perfect, apart from having to deal with witches. I'm sure they don't burn up when they die, just in torture for a while. That is why it is important you don't become a witch. You might find yourself doing these things and starting to thrive on it. Just remember you will get your dues and you will regret it more than anything. However, you can change and find the other way is rewarding in every way apart from maybe material benefits, because they have no meaning. This is the scale upon which your reactions to circumstances affects. It is very important to yourself. You will judge yourself. Don't let us down, please. S. Hartley <coughs> I being in my world is the best thing a human could do. The power is in how much you know it, and then using it. You can say to yourself, you know it a million times, and not believe it. You have to really believe it. Which isn't very easy when everyone around you hasn't, isn't. You cannot be told about it, because for you to know what the message is, you have to first know it for yourself. To use it. You just have to be aware of it when it is relevant. You can use it in two ways, for good or for bad. Just to be clear, the good way is the most productive, and for anyone reading this who would use it for bad, you will go and take a bite. When you have the knowledge, you know exactly what you're at, what to do. You'll just be reacting to any occurrence and loving it. Living for now. You get so much out of being with happy people, and both or all people get just as much out. Two pluses make a plus. Also, with two of you, you can learn a lot about each other without talking. With telepathy, you don't get a voice-to-voice -voice conversation, but you actually for a moment in that person or animal. You come out learning of that person's life, almost not everything, but how it is at that time. It is possible for a person to block someone doing it, and they can let you. When somebody is in the world of their own, it is easy to read them. I have not experienced reading someone and being read at the same time, but I am sure it would be a fascinating experience. I literally can't wait. I haven't met anyone since I've known properly about telepathy. It is very handy for being forewarned of something not nice happening to you from another body. I have recently discovered this warning which I first thought was just the spacious feeling type thing connected with these feelings. As it got nearer the time, the strange feeling got more scary and I finally reacted to it seconds away from the bad fate. This means, means the future can be preordained which means time is only a concept of this universe, which gives this life meaning. Without time we would go insane, 
to be able to come out of time and conceive it as a big thing when you know it it this strongly it is very powerful thing to be able to do in this reality this is why humans are lucky and you should be glad to be here and not regret or dread it is very sad that this should be used for bad believe it happens people should be happy and happy to see others happy and what and want to get good out of life all those memories that are stored to go with you when you die is all this life is for when you have the knowledge you know what goes in there and you know how important it is to that you get them good ones not bad you won't be striving in life in order to sort out your old age I can tell you I would like to think about all the people on this world knowing this but then I would be dreaming. All most people are truly interested in is comfort of money. Don't deny it because it is true. It will lead them to total destruction. But the ones with the knowledge will survive because they know what a load of bullshit it is that people believing in reality these days. A lot of people are going to die. And that's not a fact, it's logic. I won't go into it. Also with all the prophecies and the revelations in the Bible, the people wondering if it will happen. It has happened and is happening now, but everyone's too blind in their comfy lives, they can't see it. It will become more and more obvious and most people won't see it until it's much too late to do anything. Two people, Bob Marley, John Lennon, are a godsend for someone like me. Just to know I'm not the only one for sure is very reassuring. I've had to have quite a bit of faith to keep with it and get where I am today. As Marley puts it, stop the train I'm leaving. I'm going to try living my way. And it won't be long whether I'm right or wrong. I only interpret these after I've realised myself. But they give you a faith in that someone else has thought and come to the same conclusion. After all, the shit there will be room to start over. <laughs> but we will be evolved humans and our children will learn properly and the people will know how to live with no need for rules, with possessions, having no ulterior value. There might be a couple of evil ones left, but life will be happy because the power is in the knowing you progress very quickly after a while. With each thing that happens, that makes sense. A lot of the time coming out of something which didn't make sense at first. Knowing more and more and more. People can tell me I am mad until they are blue in the face and I will just pity them for their life is a sad one. When you are dead and realise you are who you are, you will judge yourself. If you do not truly repent sins, your fate is bleak and I pity you. You do not have to wait for death. To judge yourself so do it now and there is no way of lying only ignoring s hartley picture private hospice aids clinic cjd clinic chemist psychiatrists drug users clinic private hospital when all the poor are dead and your main street looks like this and there's no tramp left sitting on the park bench people won't find it strange that they have to earn thousands just to survive healthy healthily in body and mind even though the shrink can never really give people's minds what they should have clearness these people must be totally deluded in what life's about it won't be like this though this is what it's like now and people are deluded now. What they see as reality is actually the big dream. And only the dreamers hold reality. The only realistic future we have where people will live properly is with the dreamers. S. Hartley. Anyone who speaks against this way society progresses is mocked. Not taken seriously and are looked upon as idiots until they conform or die. It's not very good for humans if only a few see the way it really is and they want to bring others into clarity 
but are blocked by numerous deluded people with their made-up sayings, which when said are taken as fact and strange logic like, Life is unfair. That is true if you strive to make your standard of living greater, but you don't have to do that. When you're born, you can do anything you want. With advice from parents, you can discard it or believe it. It is only you that makes that decision. Life is very fair. Someone born poor is blessed. He is used to low standard living, so things can only but get better. He gets to see there's more to life than TV. Whether he decides he wants TV in the end is his decision. If they get a disease and die young or old, they are always going to die. Putting up with hardship as everyone is used to doing is not a valuable way to spend your time when tomorrow could be your death day. The poor man is often deluded into thinking he has to put up with hardship and it can cause bad feelings in his heart. Too many people spend their time counting money in their heads all day and night, are not properly fulfilled when in the company of others and they have rejected their soul as irrelevant. This is why people will accept the main street in the picture and ignore what the man about to be arrested is saying. These people will also ignore that they are going to die and no matter how many swimming pools and tennis courts they have, it will all disappear from their reality. If you avoid thinking about death, your fate, you will miss the fact that in order to exist at all, we have never not existed and therefore continue to do so forever. So this life is just for pleasure. We souls would only do it if we wanted to. But it is also a test, one which many people fail through following others. Since I have led my own way, I have found others like me, but only after I found it myself could I see the others. There will be more and more of us coming out. The world is destined for a happy fate, but after many fall through their greed and negative emotions, the ones left are the happy ones, and will see their reward soon. S. Hartley. Soul. The only way we know our soul is through our emotions waiting to be triggered by occurrences in our lifetime. <clears throat> now whether the emotions are chemicals or not, something had to trigger it. There has to be the first cause, and that cannot be described by the scientist. Just as no one knows the universe is beginning or who made God. It is the one flaw in our existence. In other words, logic says we shouldn't be here, but we are here. And the universe is just a concept of our conceivance. By our minds are capable of changing what we conceive with our beliefs. The power is in believing not making yourself believe, but just actually believing. When you conceive your life as a soul, you know the only reason you can live with the never-ending finish line is because of emotions. Emotions don't just happen and go away for a soul. They build him. It's what makes him. When we are on the earth, a lot of people are deluded and think that it is possessions which build you and you lose your emotions after they are felt. This is a very bad way to think, for when you die and you realise time and universe was a concept, you would be upset at how you lived your life, striving for meaningless objects. Emotions can be very complex, much more complex than the English language, for example. Most people don't get to feel a lot of emotions, which they would love their complex but precise feeling which is understood to get great potential. What? <laughs> Let me repeat that. <clears throat> Most people don't get to feel a lot of emotions which they would love 
their complex but precise feeling, which is understood to great potential. When you feel a new emotion for the seemingly first time, you have stepped up a level for before you could not comprehend it. So it has changed your perception, thus enlightening you. There is one emotion very important. It is all of them together, the importance of you, to you, your soul, your self-being. This might not sound brilliant, but it is totally unconceivable to most humans, and it is, is to me at this moment. I only have a short-term memory of me being there once. I was in control. Bloody bone. This might not sound brilliant, but it is totally unconceivable to most humans, and it is to me at this moment. I only have a short-term memory of me being there once. I was in control. I was my subconscious, and anywhere I wanted to go with me in there. First time it was very scary. New, but a bit confused with an amount of simultaneous information. A second time was better, and the confusion was listened to and made more complete sense. There was a message, a vision which came before me, a vision which came before the self-being, which is another story. If you have no soul, you are just a robot, and everything is meaningless, so you won't care for, this word, for these words. S. Hartley Soul being Soul being, I stress, is a totally different perception. When you are actually there, the only things that exist are you, your memories, and other soul and their memories. These memories are essentially what we are, whether we had an initial character or not. In every life and moment that we have been aware, we are building ourselves. Now in this conscious reality, it is a real test, because at birth we are cut off from information, which in order to be found has to be seeked. Also, there is another level. If all we souls can be connected, there must be an overall sense of it. God? I apologise for not having thought through all the implicit meanings yet. Infinity is something I can never have a concept of. It is, is concept of it, this short-term memory. But then it can only hold seven plus or minus two items. The long-term is infinite, and in there you couldn't even say infinite. <laughs> I had a dream, a very realistic one where I got sucked out because of talking about the long-term memory and trying to access the short-term. There are two complete levels. Just recalling a memory is not actually being freely in control of it. And a lot of times you are recalling a stored version with only a small part of the information. Properly accessing the long-term does have the connection into being there. Recalling anything as easily as the 2 plus 2 in the short term. In there is possible future events, total telepathy with anything, and memories of any past event, even past lives. To be able to enter and control is just a matter of conceiving it, which can be done through a fresh memory once you have experienced it once. The same as feeling a new emotion for the first time seems like accident. In this life, when you did feel happy first, love first, hate first, some you could do without, but you need to try them all to see if you want them or not. Emotions can be complex. Memories are essentially emotions, just extremely particular ones. As when you feel a new emotion, you step up a level in comprehension. So do you when you experience a new memory or experience telepathy with a person. It's what we souls want. It's what we need. We need our universe because the sim simu situations need to be real. As humans, we are progressing to need more than the fly who gets a buzz out of every beat. It is ignorant to ignore your parameters, your brain, soul, S. Hartley.
Conceivability and perceiving. Very difficult words to spell, but very important parts of our life. How we conceive is of great importance to how you react in all situations. The experiences you gain from occurrences day to day, and as you learn your perception of your environment changes along with what you can conceive. For example, you go to a totally foreign country and you learn the difference in the people and lifestyle. At first you build a very vague picture of what you know as you encounter things in the country. You build a picture of what you conceive as that place. Before you had been there, you could not conceive what you now conceive. This also happens when you merely think. You come up with conclusions that you could not have come up with before. Sometimes your thought has to come to such a stage that the conclusion about to be made is a very big one which lets you conceive something and improves your perception of. Philosophy can be a very powerful thing. It is about understanding the unknown. Firstly within our universe, the parameters of our body and then within out of our universe the parameters of our souls. Unknowns which become known through our minds, how is this done? As souls, the universe and all the other universes is just a part of our being. It is linked to us. Therefore, there must be a way of linking to our souls from this universe. There is, and we've all got one. Underestimated, it is the long-term memory. Infinite incapacity, therefore isn't contained in our heads and touches everything. Isomorphic phenomena is the link to outside. It is all around us from the seed of a tree to mathematics. Most people neglect their long-term memory and forget to access it because it is because of its enormous size and the feeling at first that being free to run was overwhelming. It is out of the concept of the universe it is your universe. To conceive it is to know it, and that is the power of freedom within it. It is capable of touching other people's long-term memories, learning of an experience, or how they conceive their life. Because of its timeless quality, where when relieving a memory, reliving a memory, you are actually there, you conceive how you conceived at that particular time. Also, you can see destinies that could happen. You are able to change them as they are insights as to what would happen if you did that, this and that. It is definitely possible that they will come true if you follow the path your insight did, to really properly conceive all. This is a beautiful life, and that's why I can't understand people would use it for bad reasons. It's what makes you realise what gift what a gift this universe and our planet Earth, with all the people to love, really is. You can conceive whatever you want. Be free and clasp life now with both hands. S. Hartley. True Story The African Witch Chapter 1 Leaving Nairobi Waiting patiently to find the Africa I imagined before the realisation of real Africa, which was the harsh ambition to develop, finally came the day I met Nina. In an office centred in Nairobi, occupied by my 50-year-old cousin, a lawyer here for many years, also waiting for Philip's presence, was a pretty African lady, who I had noticed in reception a few minutes ago. It wasn't long before we had realised who we were. Philip entered and plans were made for me to go to Uganda with Nina. She showed me pictures cut out of a magazine of a gorilla and dense African bush and said this is where I was going. Nina joked a lot of how Uganda was so much better than Kenya in every aspect, and continually mocked Philip, jokingly of course. I was glad to be leaving Nairobi and its industrial poverty, 
looking forward to finding the real Africa and its people. We all proceeded to a house in suburban Nairobi, where Nina was staying with a friend during her short visit. I was to be spending the night there and leaving on a bus early the next morning. Philip dropped me off at his house in Karen, where I was to pack and make my way to the suburban house for the evening and an early night. Philip was going away, so the plan was for me to make my own way there, but I would have had to walk because there were no buses. So Nina's friend picked me up, and from there there was no turning back. I was standing in the front yard of the suburban house, smoking a cigarette after dinner, feeling very apprehensive about the whole ordeal. Looking at the street-lit concrete estate, forced to look up for the five-foot wall, I remembered how Salma, Philip's mistress, had given me all her numbers and stressed that I was to phone her about anything. She was very caring character, but there was something more in her eyes. I took no notice at the time. I slept well and we were off in the morning, on time and without any problems. Chapter 2 White Man Alone Sitting on the bus in Nina's strongly recommended seats, watching some men gulping down their first cuppa before work starts for them. The bus is only a quarter filled, and I'm hoping it stays that way. It does. And we're on our way to hopeful Uganda, with its promising president and lingering greenness. On our way down there, there are no problems. Just a couple of stops, chances for me to smoke a fag, and ask locals if they like marijuana and trees. <laughs> Nina and I chat a lot, and I am very open to her, and find that we are quite different, and she despises cannabis. She tells me her brother got AIDS because of it, which is quite literally bullshit. <laughs> Nina is a compulsive liar and trickster with words. Her morals are like those in Victorian England, and she has dark eyes with a purple tint. Freaky. We arrive in Kampala, get a bus to Entebbe, where my father grew up, and get a taxi to her house, which is next to Lake Victoria, with only a few bushes and a deserted field with two old aeroplanes on. We are tired, have dinner with her two daughters, and they are making plans of all the things I will do. I only know one thing. I want to see the bush and gorillas, which isn't anywhere near here. There may be a lot of green, but it's common grass and Kampala is ten times worse than Nairobi. I have been told a few fibs. As soon as I got into Uganda, I've had connections to the dreams I had in England. I feel like it's an adventure waiting to happen. It's the strange way of advertisement they use that, it, that triggers it. I'm spending my time eating and reading and doing things that Nina wants me to do, but I feel something is going to happen soon. The morning after we arrive, Nina sends me down to where the aeroplanes are to fetch a guy called Pontius. My first sight of him is climbing into one of the windows of the aeroplanes, and I'm calling... Pontiopus, because that's what Nina told me his name was. I tell him Nina wants him for work at her house, and he comes back with me. I ask him my usual questions. Do you like marijuana and trees? He answers, I love them. <laughs> In my books at that time, it made him an instant friend. I need someone to see the bush with. And seeing as Nina won't or her daughter Helen, Pontius seems a good prospect. Question mark. Chapter 3. The worst but best day of my life. Separate story. My Fate in Africa by Stephen Hartley. 100% true story. The worst but best day of my life so far. Lake Victoria, 
Entebbe, Uganda, 11 o'clock, Saturday night. The music from the disco is blaring and I nearly lose everything. Late October 1996, a view of Lake Victoria, Uganda, Africa. Yesterday was a very special day. It was that day that all the special feelings about Africa that I had came to light. I was always thinking to myself that the feelings and the dreams were of an exciting adventure, when in fact yesterday could and nearly was my death day. I am very sorry to all that care about me that I let myself get so close. But I am here today and I am not the same person. I am Meta Stephen. I have reached the first enlightenment stage in the powers of the mind. The nagging voice which I was ignoring has come to light and passed. It started when I met a man called Pontius, believe it or not. He was a dope smoker, and I had a smoke with him. Because of my trusting nature, I thought he was like me, and wise in the powers of the mind. He seemed to be a man who lives his life and the same morals as I. But the conversations we had were too much one way, and I thought it was just a language difficulty. The day I met him, I had three beyond type feelings, and saw them as the exciting adventure ahead, but they were the warning. I thought the test ahead of me was just to trust them, although in the wrong way, and I would have a prosperous, fulfilling time in the bush with this Pontius. After that day, I had a couple of days without smoking with him, but was looking forward to the next time that we would have a deep conversation. I kept getting these images of him just taking off with my rucksack and leaving me in the bush, so I knew I had to give him a final test. I wanted so much to be right about him being this wise man that it was confusing me a bit. The people I am staying with were advising me against it, and I was just saying to myself to trust my feelings although they were right, but I was just reading them wrongly. I had set it up so I could spend some time with him to test him on a Saturday night. That day the nagging in my head was stronger, and I was thinking of allowing him to steal my camera that night, so that if he was going to do it, he could do it then. Little did I think that I might die in the process. Luck hit me that evening at sunset. While he was still working on Nina's drive with Nina, I ran out to get my camera and take a picture. I showed my camera to Pontius, and then we were saying goodbye. See you tonight, he said. You're bringing your camera, of course. That made me worry a bit. I'd already told him I was going to bring it, but it made me not want to bring it. I started to worry about this night and didn't want to go at all, but I had to. The time came for me to leave and I told Nina I might be away all night, but I was a bit worried, so I said if I don't stay, I'll be back by 11. I have to say Nina and Helen were very much against all of this, but I persistently talked them round and I am so sorry that I nearly put them in a very horrible position. I started to walk down without my camera, but I was wearing my new boots because the others were wet. As I was walking, I was getting strong connections to these dreams about Africa, and although I smiled at them, there was an eerie feeling about it. I got to him and the music from the neighbouring disco was very loud, which could be a good disguise for a scream or two. 
He asked why I didn't bring my camera, and I just said that I couldn't be bothered. There was another guy with him, and he said he was the other watchman, and I had seen him before, so I thought it was safe. But when I asked him his name, he said he'd tell me later, and looked at Pontius. I assumed it was because smoking hash here can be dangerous. When I am testing people, I always act stupid and give them their own excuses to keep them thinking that everything is going right for them. We all three went to sit on the beach to smoke our joints. I thought it was because it, it is clean and out of sight. This is where my doubts began. The other guy had a panga, a long knife, which could be for trespasses, but Pontius never carries one. The guy was also from Kenya. As Pontius is from Zaire, and neither have firm contacts in Uganda, and could take off at any time. Before I thought Pontius had no contacts because of his wise mind, like I do not like the government in England to know about me. The other guy was also very interested in my boots, and I told him I defend them well. He just smiled and laid back, which is how he spent the next hour or so. The things Pontius and I were talking about were not at all on a high level. He told me things he had already said when we had our first smoke, which I put aside as someone who may repeat things. He asked me if airports had a machine that silenced the aeroplanes when they are landing, and if he was wise he would have known that they don't need much engine power to land as they do when they take off. He told me about the one time that he had been on an aeroplane, that he tried everything out as I had on my first time but I was a young boy. He said that sitting in the plane, his own man, that he felt powerful. I would never have used that word unless I was talking about the power of the mind. It was then that I knew that he was not the person I thought he was. Also, he was, he was not a proper hash smoker, as he wasn't inhaling and holding, and when I made it obvious that I was, he tried to copy me, but took very small puffs, blew a bit out, then held the air in, and even then he was getting too stoned. By this time I was very worried, and I could barely hide it. I must have looked like I'd seen a ghost. The last straw that he came out with, we will be great friends when we go to the bush. Totally the wrong time. By now I was shitting myself but just relaxed and lay down to look at the sky. I was a bit cold and my jumper and jacket was in his shed, locked. I said I would have to go and get it in a minute. By now I think he was going to get things started, because he was looking over at the gate as if he was about to check it. When I laid back I saw the devil in the sky and was probably close to being killed. The lake edge has a plant which will not only pull you down, but is poisonous as well and they could have just said, I went swimming. When Pontius got up to go and look, I got up to walk in the opposite direction towards the shed. The area is about ten acres. There is a very bright light in your face when you walk, and my bad feelings were like being on a very bad acid tab. I had to pull myself together and stop being too scared. I knew this was the night all my dreams about Africa had been pointing to, I think also that Emily might have sensed this night, but I wouldn't have wanted her to say anything. I pulled myself together by playing with a sharp stick, waiting for him to come and unlock the shed. He came back on his own and said I should go home, talking to me like I was a twelve-year-old. I asked where was the other guy, and he said he was still lying on the beach, but he wasn't. He was waiting to get me on my way out. There is plenty of ambush opportunity with the two planes in the field. I made Pontius escort me the back shortcut way and let him believe by saying I pulled a whitey, which is when you get too stoned, that I still wanted him to take me to the bush. I was walking behind him, ready to punch his lights out, and by this time I was pretty sure I would be safe, and I was. From this I have learned not to trust anyone, and I have also learned how to read my feelings. I am 300% sure of them, and I know where I am going. I know how to get in touch with them, 
I can see where I'm going in life and I don't have to try to be positive with everything to do with this amazing way of living and I was before because I was a bit confused. It was my enlightenment day, done on my own. My fight with the devil is over and best of all I am still here in the land of the living. When I was sitting here composing myself last night, God winked at me to tell me everything will be alright, and I felt his touch on my head. From now on, I will not try and talk other people into using their heads. They can do it themselves. But there is someone very close to me, and if she hasn't already advanced in this field, she will now. I love Lloyd S. Hartley. There are many more followers of the devil than we realise. The followers themselves may not even realise what they are doing. I will be looking out for these people in the future. I will also only trust when I have built that trust. Chapter 4. African Bush I am re very relieved to be alive and a bit wary of strangers, but looking forward to seeing the African Bush. Helen has taken me to Fort Portal in West Uganda, where I will try and find a cheap campsite and chill out on my own for a while. I talk to Helen a lot, and the more I find out about her, I start to feel like she is being manipulated by her mother. She is 25 and has never kissed a man. She works like a slave, doesn't take holidays, and she enjoys to manipulate, lie and make sneaky plans which she learns from. The more I think of it, I suspect Nina is a witch, and she wants Helen to be her predecessor. I dismiss it because they have been so good to me, but then again it's quite a good alibi. Helen wouldn't know it yet, and I hope I helped her by pointing out to her what she does. They both have the same white streak in their hair. The more I think about it, the more this possibility haunts me. I camp for a week after Helen goes home, then I meet a girl called Beza from England. She is doing conservation on a lake and invites me to stay with her and help. It is purely platonic. I cope, but maybe I could have done more with her instead of enjoying the scenery so much. I spend a month and a half and it was very safe apart from one day which I can do mo no more than suspect. I had been shopping in Fort Portal one day and was waiting for the ride in a Matatu bus for a good while when I was approached when I was approached. I talked to this guy and he was very friendly. He said he was a student at university in Kampala. He had the bus ticket to prove it. He told me he was visiting his rich father near where I was going, but he ended up wanting to come with me. I wasn't thinking anything suspect and was happening and he was very well spoken with a lot of views all over an interesting person. Beza met him and we talked for a long time. We were getting on very well. The time came when he should be going to his father's. We offered him to stay the night but I think he had no intention to go home before dark. It's getting dark. And he becomes persistent about getting a beer from Kabata, about a kilometre away. I tell him he can go on his own because I can't be bothered. It isn't safe for a white man to go out at night anyway. I begin to worry about him and I ask him for an arm wrestle. I beat him too easily and it makes me very wary. I discard it and assume he is weak. <laughs> it's dark now and we're singing redemption song. He is out of tune, which makes it hard for me to sing. When we've finished, I give in and say I'll go with him, thinking what harm could he possibly do to me. We are walking, and he gets me to sing it again. I'm thinking what a prat am I to have brought him back. I'm singing half-heartedly, and when I'm finished, I get a very bad feeling about him. I stop and say we're going back now. His personality changes completely. He says in a wise, mysterious way, trust those feelings of inner consciousness. Walking back, he says normally again that he had also had a feeling 
and it wasn't good. He and I were going for a beer in Kabata. This guy was trying to manipulate me, but I knew he was. We got back and I decided to tell him what I thought. When I told him, he went straight to Beza, and she also thought bad of him after we had sung Redemption Song first time around. We argued and argued. Physically, he had everything to prove he was all right, but then he would make sure of it. We got rid of him by getting him a lift to his father's exit. I stayed behind to think. I couldn't prove to anyone else he was up to something, but I knew. I still don't know what he wanted. Was he sent by Nina, or was it planned to be a long-term con? Chapter 5. It's not over yet. I am now very low on money, and know that I'll be off in a few days. I have a fever, and as soon as I'm feeling a bit better, I will go home. I'm not looking forward to going to Entebbe, and I wish I could skip Entebbe and go straight to Nairobi. I can't. I have a few belongings and some of my writings, but I am very worried. I don't know why. I say goodbye to Beza in Fort Portal. I'll stay in a hotel and get the post bus to Kampala in the morning. There is a chance my fever was malaria and I have taken a larium because I was only taking half the recommended dosage of paladrin. The larium has affected my personality a bit. The hotel staff are awful and I'm doing my fair share of shouting. The staff are rude, ignorant and they lie. I've got a 500 gram peanut jar full of cannabis which I couldn't throw away just yet. I don't think I want to go through Kenyan customs with it. I wake in the morning and I get the post bus to Kampala. Nice journey. I'm thinking of my family and friends and just want to be home. I finally get to Entebbe, knackered, knowing Nina won't be happy that I've been away so long. When I approach the house, I am very weary. I have not told her I was coming today and I'm worried she might have gone away. She's not in, so I sit down and smoke a spliff. Every now and then I hear a chunk inside the house, like someone plunking a cuppa on a table. I'm calling, Nina, but no answer. I'm hungry, so I hide my rucksack at the back and get some food from a shack. They say Helen has gone away, but Nina should be there. <coughs> It's mango season. The red mango tastes okay, but leaves strands in your teeth for a good hour, and the green ones don't taste of anything much. Entebbe is different. The Yanks are here with their planes, I assume because of the trouble in Zaire. Apparently, if I try to get any pictures, they'll bust my camera. The locals, that is. I get back to Nina's, grab my sack, and after half a minute, she comes walking down. I think she's been in all the time. First thing she says is, Wicked child! And then tells me how naughty I've been and how much trouble I've caused. I tell her I'm off tomorrow. She doesn't like it, but I'm itching to get back. She has been in all the time. She's been doing the ironing. Bloody witch. <clears throat> I approach her outside and tell her I've got something big to throw away. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's the peanut jar of cannabis. Very out of character, she doesn't say a word. I ask her what customs are like in Kenya. She says, Oh, if you pack it well. Nothing else said. You don't know how strange that is for her. Normally she would throw it herself. I'm definitely not taking it. I leave it out on show for the night and it's not touched. I think she's... I think she thinks I want to take it and I'm just trying to convince her that I don't. I am taking the night bus tomorrow and Helen's back and she will take me into Kampala to book one of the buses. Nina has suddenly got a cough, a suffocating cough. Strange that such a healthy person should get a cough. 
I have a magnificent sleep and a beautiful dream, very good, godly sort of dream. I wake up extremely happy. The joy must be glowing through the house. <laughs> I put my clothes on. By the time I walk out of my bedroom, someone is storming out of the house, quietly without a word. Helen's still here. Nina knows I'm going today, but she doesn't come back to say goodbye. I throw away my cannabis, but stuff a bit in the battery compartment in my flash. No one will find or smell it there. Nina thinks I'm taking the grass. Where has she gone? Which? Helen and I go and book the bus. It's a big African bus, brightly coloured and looks really cool. I say goodbye to Helen and shortly I'm on my way. Chapter 6 Oh, what a fate it could have been. Happy to see Kampala going away. It's not long until we are at customs, and I stay on the bus because I'm worried that I'll lose it and I'll be stuck in a not very nice place. We're in Kenya, and all I'm thinking about is having a wee. There is a long way to go. We stop, so I jump off, and then I can't go, and the bus starts to drive off. <laughs> I stop it and get on. They stop again at a police check, and I jump off saying, don't drive off. I manage to get a bit out, so it's okay. We have another police check. Then we approach the first town, and another police check. I'm looking at them through the window, and this check seems a bit different. They ask me to get off and open my luggage. I jump off calmly, and they show me a flowery suitcase, so I tell them it isn't mine. There's my rucksack there. I grab it out of the hold and flap off the lid. They can tell from my attitude that I'm not hiding anything and allow me back on the bus. We drive off, but we're not getting on with our journey to Nairobi. We're stopping in an unused road and all are getting off the bus. This is no normal police check. They are looking for something. Everyone is looking at everyone else and no one looks guilty about anything, so I'm glad I chucked away my cannabis. I'm beginning to feel slightly guilty when I heard the word Njagu mentioned by a few people. Njagu, Njaga, means cannabis in Lugandan. The police are being very thorough and look as if they won't give up. They check everyone's hand luggage. People are beginning to look at me, the only white man, the police are also looking at me. I approach the head policeman and ask him what's going on. This doesn't look like a spot check. He says, sort of, but we do suspect something. He then confirms that this is the Kampala to Nairobi and not to Mombasa. He asks me where I'm coming from and I know he was suspecting me again. I was prepared to have my rucksack searched again, but I was very nervy. I was getting very nervy and knew they had been tipped off. I walked towards the bus to get on, and I could feel his eyes and mind fixed on me, reassessing my words and actions. I got on and heard him saying something to the driver about when we stop in the next town a couple of miles away. I didn't think it was over. If they had continued exploring the possibility of me smuggling, I would have cracked. If I had taken the peanut butter pot full, I would have cracked ages ago and be facing a lengthy jail sentence and a fucked up life. When we stopped in the town for food, I thought they were being held I thought we were being held in a hotel for the night. Paranoid. I didn't have any Kenyan money, so I sat outside smoking cigarettes and thinking very hard. A boy approached me and said, Give me money. I was a bit hard on him and said if I had had any money would I be sitting here starving? <laughs> I gave him a fag and apologised because I was actually very relieved that I had survived the African adventure. We were soon on our way to Nairobi and my thoughts turned to Nina. She's a witch and more than that. She had failed on two, two accounts. She had failed to read me right, meaning I didn't fall into her plan and even more failure for her. She had lost control of her evil emotions and let her evil identity be known. 
For a witch to stay unknown, they have to make people harm themselves. So the blame is put not on the witch, but on the person. Nina tipped off the police and therefore had a physical hand in the evil act. She was punished. She also had made it so Philip would not be able to help me. She had predicted the possibility to him and would have said, I told you so afterwards. That's why she had already started the suffocating cough. When I was becoming safer, I could see her cough becoming worse and worse. I could see the panic in her eyes and the attempts to scream whenever she got a breath. I could see her falling on the floor and seeing death before her. I could see it killing her without relent or forgiveness. I looked forward and saw her face in the glass. She survived, but she was defeated. Be aware of the witch, S. Hartley. I'll make a note now, May 2014, that um, about seven or eight years ago, uh, Nina was actually murdered, hacked to death, um, accused of being a witch. And that was not from me because I didn't publish the story or anything. Thoughts govern responses in our physical bodies. Are our bodies just receptacles for the ongoing discussion in our minds? First, we have the basic everyday actions we take, like walking, making lunch, are of course controlled by our minds. When we talk to somebody, the subject is on the mind, and the thought comes first, whether it's well thought through or not. There are many things our bodies feel which are different to moving legs back and forth. Emotions. Emotions normally have some chemical reaction in our bodies, like butterflies. The day after you fall in love, you might feel very good by thinking of your new love. If you have to go to a job and you dread it, you can be feeling bad for it is on your mind. Because we control these thoughts, we control all that comes with them. Do we control our heartbeat? Our heart beats. We do not need to think about it beating to make it beat, but then we have never known it not to beat. The part of our mind which makes our heart beat is 99% of the time in our subconscious. I wouldn't be surprised, however, if people had caused themselves heart attacks by thinking of having a heart attack. Paranoia. Our thought can control the heartbeat. Many times we will be walking voluntary and the walking becomes as unconsciously done as our heartbeat. It's just accessing the control of our heart. is rarely done when controlling our feet is always done. Most of the time, people will not be looking deeply into the physical signs which tell them the current position of their minds. Note for Special Forces, Her Majesty's Army. The way the world is going today, with more scientific proof of the illogical becoming accepted, you can't deny, as an important force, the army, you play a big role. I am talking about the near future of our country's future and our world's future. More importantly is the effects the future will have for the individual, not just in England, but through the whole world. I know the powers of this country are not stupid and would never be ignorant with a matter as important as our future. Neither do a lot of the citizens of this generation. Just today, I heard the senior rep for England told the European Council, mad cow's disease was an act of God, for example. The reason I'm writing is, firstly, I find the current position of our world is seriously troubled. Secondly, I want to offer what I believe is a contribution to the world. I don't feel that there is a way to save the world. It's dead as far as most of the people are concerned, but life will carry on, and I need to know if there is anything I can do. This letter will probably not be taken as is meant, and your opportunity to find whether I am for real or not will pass. What I am offering is my philosophy, 
which I feel should be taught to the people as the events in the future crop up. It's the people who will be affected and it's the people which will affect. I'm sure you already have people on this and all I am asking for now is a reply to this letter even if it's telling me to get lost. I want a response. Yours, S. Hartley, 15th 1st, 97. Love or war? War is a substitute for love. Love would never be a substitute for war. Love and war are strongly linked because of their opposition. There are many words for emotions, but they could all be contained in two words. Love, hate. In love you love, and in war you hate. Love is superior for obvious reasons, like you don't have to kill someone, you can do it again and again, without any repercussions from the act of loving. Love is also superior because of hate being a mere substitute for love. A man who hates is a man who is too incompetent and weak to love. A man might lose a love or feel the sense of no love and alone decides to project his pitiful hate on others through self-pity. One who can love without biasing is secure and happy and one who loves all will have his reward. Those who love only outside, but it is not true inside, is not just weak but is evil, which is not an accepted motive for happiness because it is a very weak bond and will melt with the realisation of soul. Sometimes one might find it necessary to fight hate and find themselves using their own hate to fight it. The way to fight hate is with love. When love is projected against hate, it drives the hate out of control and into insanity. As the Bible says, if a man slaps you on the cheek, do not run away in fear or hit back in anger, but turn the other cheek and accept another slap with love. If I myself ever project hate to win a battle which I have put myself in, I will repent, for my main cause is for love, and that will be in my mind with me. I am soon beginning beginning a fight for love against the hate present in the world, which kills everything on every level. I believe I can do good for our souls, so I am going to bloody try, and if anyone dislikes my cause, then I hope you find your peace in this lifetime. Yes, Hartley. Africa will unite. With Africans' troubles within their own continent, they have built stronger armies and huge populations. The young civilians are already good at following orders and work very hard and don't cost much. Africa has been given back independence and will have done accumulate wealth. As soon as their civil type wars become stalemate, Africa will unite. Wars may be declared by the leaders, but they are fought by the individual. In first world countries, most people do not want to fight in a war, for they believe they have much to lose. If Africa was to unite and decide to attack another country for whatever reason, they would make a very large impact. Imagine if they got to the stage where the army called men into war. The average bloke would not have the courage or want to fight. In a third world country, however, the average bloke already accepts death and could come the next day and, because of their history, would also find a reason to fight with passion. Before in history, a small poor army has fought a large powerful country and won. They may not have taken over a superpower, but they have stunned the world with the impact that the individual can make. I believe the English army is paranoid of an attack on the Commonwealth in Africa by the Africans. There is still a large debt most African countries hold with the World Bank and they rely on export with their poor people to pay this back. This will lead to running the country dry. The World Bank may let off a few debts to good leaders but have no compassion for corruption. If Africa is in a no-win situation, all they can do is fight. I think we are going to see a need for the average bloke to face his death in what would be the biggest rebel war ever. World War Three, S. Hartley. (laughs) 
Nature. Nature is the phenomena which strives to keep life moving under changing circumstances. Like God, the cause, first cause, can never be explained. Even with the Big Bang Theory, it does not explain the first cause. Everything is stemmed from nature. Plastic seats, space rockets, everything. The way things are going in our world, we are trying to replace what nature made with things that nature's nature is making. The direct cause of this is Homo sapiens. The problem is that our creations often challenge what nature has made before us. When this happens, nature, as always, creates something to suit the changing environment. Nature is somehow very clever and challenges the direct cause, Homo sapiens, to the problem which it has been affected by. E.g. Humans make new clouds from industry, which in turn affects our air which we need to breathe. It warms ice which floods the land we need to stand on. It rains acid which infects the food we eat, etc. Anything we try to do to challenge nature will cause a reaction from nature which will annihilate the direct cause. Artificial intelligence, robots cause humans' nature to replace jobs done by humans. Humans who program computers may one day program a computer to program a computer. You could have a situation where humans become obsolete in the whole economic infrastructure, where all the resources are one man and his computer. Hypothetical maybe, but the whole point of it is that it challenges nature, and we are an essential part at the moment that seems to be striving to take us out of the equation. Nature would carry on as normal, even if the earth goes hurt hurtling into the sun. Nature knows what is happening at the moment and is killing off Homo sapiens with diseases, pollution, humans killing humans and taking away the fundamental parts that humans need for precious life. If all humans died today, the earth would repair itself and carry on giving the gift of life. That's our thing. <clears throat> Nine Insights Stephen Hartley's Translations 1. An occurrence that has happened was destined. Number 2. Self, soul, individual concept Realization and perception. Three, positive living energy, traveling, building, and amplifying. Number four, energy can be in conflict or be given. Number five, inexhaustible energy called love, love of everything. Number six, seek truth. Hold truth, be true. Number seven, read the signs from within to put you on the right track. Number eight, for the individual, once complete, interaction is the key. Number nine, evolve. The nine insights. These insights are based on a manuscript from Peru, written somewhere within the region of 600 BC. They are basically a prophecy along the lines of Nostradamus and the revelations from the Bible. I read a book written by James Redfield. It is an adventure where he finds all of these insights by experience. As I read, I can relate to them and try to sum up the insight in a short saying, which is how I always imagined these nine insights would be. Only being able to understand them once you've understood first. I feel they would be more of a guide for enlightenment rather than giving you enlightenment. The first one is easy to grasp, but very important. Anything that has happened was destined. Why you were born, when, where and to who, right up until the day you die. If you believe in this, it makes life perfect in a strange way. It allows you to continue every day with the hope of reaching your destiny. When you fail something, or something isn't working, you can decide it was fate, 
and be glad that it happened. It's not to say that you should never achieve, but it says not to lose heart. The second insight is a realisation of who and what you are. You are an individual who was born and will die, and all you know is that you have a life to live. If we are a human being, we have a lot of history behind us to tell us who we are, and this can be distracting when trying to see yourself as an individual. The generation now was born with two world wars behind us, kings and queens, etc., and scientific technology. If you perceive your life as a chapter in your soul life, then all this history is just your parameters in which to work in, and it is not you. You are the constant. Every day you may feel different to yesterday, and are different, but you will always be you. Just for the people who cannot grasp the soul thinking, if we are not able to understand infinity in our brains, it is for the reason that our lives wouldn't be a good test if we knew we were infinite. If they weren't infinite, we would have no need to love and we wouldn't be here in the first place. The third insight is that we have an inner energy and that every living thing has this. In the book, this is described as a visible glow around living things but I don't think it is necessary to see it. Just to know it and feel it is enough. I personally can remember times in my childhood when I've looked at someone and seen a glow on a particular person at a particular time. This energy can be high and low, which we all know, to be conscious of it, and can keep yours at a feel-good factor. Many things can be done with the energy. The fourth insight is about how to use your energy. It seems to work the opposite way to collecting material belongings. If you try and take other people's and be selfish, just trying to keep yours up, it will never thrive in a positive way, or maybe that is like collecting material belongings. The best way is to feel it and embrace it by giving, and seeing others getting it will certainly maintain yours. There isn't a clear-cut way of using it, but just to remain positive and good. The fifth insight is the inexhaustible supply of this energy which anyone can access if they have realised the previous four. Of course, you may never have read the nine insights, but you already understand them in your own course of thought. To access this can only be described as an emotion of love, Love for everything. Everything means everything, the universe and beyond. The sixth insight. Seek truth, hold truth, be true. Self-explanatory. The seventh insight. Read the signs within you to put you on the right track. This is about visions and dreams and thoughts. If you are presently having to make a decision about something and a thought or a vision comes to you, you should listen to it, and if it's telling you something you should think to trust it. It also could be a warning. Only you can decide your own thoughts, whether it might be true or not. Dreams can only really be deciphered by yourself, because you know your position best. If you have a reoccurring dream, you must wonder what you are not doing. The eighth insight. For the individual wants complete interaction is the key. The first part of that insight is something that helped me as I was reading. A person might find themselves as I did, waiting for a partner to come along to make them complete. This insight suggests you should first become complete, then you can take on a partner and have a successful relationship without the power struggle. The ninth insight. The ninth insight is about the future and how human beings will act after the first eight insights are understood. This is unfortunately where, this book, where the book falls apart and the characters lose character. The book makes out that we will exist on a higher vibration and disappear into heaven. The truth is no one knows the future, and maybe one day's humans might exist as an invisible entity, but not in the next thousand years. 
we can all guess how we might evolve. Best to take things a step at a time, and I would say not to challenge nature. That's heartening. So here it is that I sit, ponder on what to write, express the position I am in. I have believed and I have known many times over, and now I believe it is time to act. Do I tackle my enemies in the concrete jungle, or leave them, let them fight their own battle? It is clear what to do, for if I leave I may lose touch, and if I stay I can always leave when I want. If I stay, I can also help those who have not yet known what I have come to know. I must make a promise to myself, which is not to lose myself. I am a leader. I will lead my life in the way I see best, down to the most fundamental decision. I have decided to live my life in an environment which doesn't depress me. This environment is natural. If anyone follows me, it is just a bonus and maybe means my way of life is a popular one. I am a teacher and I will try and teach those who come in close proximity to me. I will teach what I have learnt myself. Some won't want to listen, but I will not force them to. I will be compassionate to their philosophy. To those who do listen, I will be happy as they learn, and I will believe I am helping them. I am truthful to myself, and anything I enforce as a belief is true, as I know at that time. I am also a student, and also I am a follower, as are, as are my leader and teacher. If I learn lies, I will decipher them as a lie, but when I learn truth, I know in my heart it is true. I am a servant to my leader, as it makes me happy to bring happiness to my leader as well as being happy from learning. <laughs> I will stand by my knowledge, and I will stand strong for what else is there to do if you hold a belief. I won't change my belief. But as I learn, it will progress and maybe change the exterior. The interior, however, stays the same, on the same course, with goals, but the destination is unknown, if there is ever an end. Without belief, there will never be any knowledge. So in order to know who you are, you have to first believe that you might be something. If you are not prepared for the knowledge, you will never know, though everything you may believe will not become known. Find your path and destiny by eliminating the false beliefs. The way to do this is to live them. Once you find the knowledge, then you are on the right track to the next level and can be happy that you have not failed yourself or your teacher, whoever that might be. Do not be dissuaded by a simple life, for a simple life would normally be the happiest, which after all is the highest level of achievement. Belief. Solid, liquid, gas. Earth's evolving. Every living being on this planet evolves to suit life being able to continue. 
We all started from bacteria and decided life could be more interesting if we took on more complicated forms. The present position of our Earth has had many years of evolving and I feel has taken three major groups, solid, liquid and gas. First came the plant tree, fixed in one place on the Earth as the particles in a solid object are fixed. Second was the fish, being in liquid, is able to move but the movement is restricted. Then came the air breather, land walker, and sky's the limit. The reason I have linked involvement with solid, liquid and gas is because of the freedom that they have. The more freedom you have, the more you can accomplish. Trees have been evolving for the longest and have probably reached the furthest stage that is possible. The next necessary step took us to whales and turtles, which I would say have also reached the furthest stage of evolving. Then we come into it humans, I would say, have definitely not evolved to the furthest stage. We have the most freedom and could be capable of much more. If we do find ourselves evolving complete, does it stop there? I would say no. It is more logical to say we would spur a new level to life whatever that may be. What is beyond gas? Maybe it is a singular atom able to go anywhere it likes. Is there such a state of being? If there was, would we already know about it? <laughs> there are a lot of questions being asked in this day of age about such freedom. There are also a lot of mysteries that might be answered by a high level. Maybe our evolving completion of the gas state isn't so far off after all. S. Hartwell. Feelings not described in the English Dictionary. Deja vu. The only feeling which has been discarded because they think they know what the brain does to cause this. If the brain does something like this, something has to cause that cause. There is a reason for it. It is difficult to know what it means when deja vu happens, but I once felt it was telling me I had to make a decision. A decision that I wouldn't have made under normal circumstances. I once was sitting with friends and felt a deja vu, which felt I had been there not just once before, but a few times. I left and went home immediately. It was at a time when I had to get a job if I wanted to go to Africa. That morning I was woken up with a phone from someone giving me a job starting that afternoon. However, not all deja vus mean that and still only the beholder can decipher the meaning. Feeling of largeness. This feeling is easy to describe and like deja vu a lot of people would have felt it. If you sit in a dim light and look at the end of the room and the feeling of largeness would make you feel that the end of the wall is smaller but right next to your eyes. In other words, you fill the whole room. This may be where the expression I feel like I could touch the clouds comes from. The most powerful feeling of largeness I have had was in a well-lit room talking to my grandfather. In that situation it was invigorating and extremely uplifting. That is what this feeling is about. It gives you energy and confidence on a spiritual level. Love of Evil I have often pondered on this question. If evil is present, what does love do to react? If you give love to evil, then surely you must be unaware, and the evil one would just be glad that its pretense has succeeded. The question that I have asked myself is, if you challenge evil with good and eliminate the evil, is, is that a good thing? My answer is yes, because to see evil perish is to see love flourish for the amount of both together will always be the same. Like a set of scales, the amount of the whole set is always level whether one sits higher or if they sit level. This is why you as a good soul would be glad to see evil perish and it would not be, and it would not be evil to be glad. Thankfully good is not at all like evil. Even though they are opposite, to love is to love life and to live to love, and is not dependent on evil to be able to love, whereas evil is dependent on love to continue, for if the scale were fully on evil, then all evil would 
spring would be death for all. There would be no meaning to life, only death. That is not what we are about. We are given life and therefore should live, not live the opposite. For a good person there should be no fear of evil, for it would not work. It could never continue forever as good could. The only thing you should fear in this world especially is not being good yourself, for you would have no future. <coughs> My position, 29th of May, 1997. The state I am in now, with how my life is going to lead, stands two possible paths, love or war. The reason for this is not rebellion, but comes from inside. And if I could change this ultimatum, I wouldn't want to. War is a substitute for love, so you would expect that love should come first. I have loved before, but the love has gone away. Not entirely, but just from present feelings. There is a saying, to love is to risk not being loved. To hope is to risk having that hope lost. To commit is to risk your heart. But the biggest risk of all is not to risk. It is a good saying, and people should take risks. But to commit to your love is a very serious risk indeed. I have loved before and hoped, but now at the mere age of 20 I have committed without even thinking of the risks. It won't be very long now until I know whether I have lost my heart or be allowed to love more than anyone in the world and be, yeah, yeah, love just strange things. However, if I lose my heart, I know I will not be able to love another for a very long time, maybe even my whole life. This isn't saying I'll change my personality, but I will have to find a substitute to even get up in the morning, and chocolate could not do that. I know exactly what I'll have to do. It is no threat to know this before the outcome of the verdict. It is just a fact. I know what will happen inside me, and I will have to forget every minute of the day the soul I am committed to. I am not a person who takes emotions lightly or get them confused. They are what I am and what life is. I am committed to a girl named Emily Cooper, and I am sure as day that she is to me. We just don't know each other's yet. If it is not, I will still live with my cause intact, but without love. This would not be the fate I would choose, Miss Hartley. <laughs> Sarah, Alice and Emily. Letter in rough, Ministry of Defence, to whoever it may concern. I'll start by saying that I'll ask nothing of you at all, only offer advice I believe is needed from a civilian in this time. I do not have to tell you some people's perception of the world are rapidly changing. It is the individuals at the moment who are finding out from the small information that is around what reality we are living in. Most people, however, however will not and I fear what it will do if they are suddenly enlightened to it. I do not know what you are doing about it. I only guess you have preconceived being that defence is all about prediction. An insane world might be inevitable. It might even be to an advantage for a particular cause. The Ministry of Defence should be on this threat as a number one priority. People are getting bad information through channels that get to most naive of us. This tells me all is not being done by the appropriate few, and that should not be acceptable. <laughs> My calling, age 20, 1st of June, 97. Fate has played a hand concerning a very important two-way decision. Three times it has pushed me towards and away from another. This is a calling. In another paper I wrote that this decision was about love and war, substitutes. This fate has pulled me away from joining the church and joining the army. Both can be seen as substitutes of love. 
Fate first played a hand when one night camping with my brothers, I decided I wasn't going to join the army and that I would join the church. We got home early in the morning and the phone rang giving me an interview for a job growing trees, which I would snap up without hesitation if I got it. I didn't get it. A few weeks on I decided I would join the army and first go away for a few weeks. I asked my mother to phone and see how long it would take. She only found out that all I had to do was phone them. <laughs> the day I got back to ask her about what happened, I was excited about getting on and leaving. I glanced at the job pages in the Banbury Guardian just because it was there and saw a rare job advertisement based in our neighbouring village in horticulture. Horticulture is about growing stuff, normally inside. This struck me as a stroke of fate but didn't put me off the army for long. The day I rang them, I got a shock. It would take me longer than I thought to be an officer. There is a different process, so I'd have to pick up some papers first. I begged for my old job back and made the necessary actions to join as an officer, and my first appointment was in a couple of weeks on the 3rd of June. A few days ago, fate played the last hand and the best one. Come home from work, Banbury Guardian Day, which had not been delivered the week before. Some cock up a lot for a lot of Banbury. It had a job as a gardener for a national trust somewhere around Banbury, which if you don't know is perfect for me. It cheered me up no end for I had had a crap day. If you had if you have read the paper mentioned earlier, you would know there is another factor in the decision, whether I need a substitute or not. I came to a very possible conclusion which pleased me immensely and made me change my mind about the army. Love or war, decision for definite. I know where I am going. Again. Bless her. No, you don't. <laughs> Perfect solution. How are humans as evolved species? How are humans, as an evolved species, going to perform? How are we going to live in peace with nature as well as ourselves? The truth is, no one has got a clue. There isn't going to be a scientist solving all our problems with nuclear fusion, making food and water with hydrogen atoms. The nuclear waste is enough to anger nature and wipe us all out. Since science has tried, tried people have num numbed their brains since science has tried people have numbered, numbed their brains just to expect the white coats to solve all the problems it can't happen this time one thing I'm sure of and that it's up to the individual to solve his own evolving test and to realise how he may live I myself can only imagine how it will be not to challenge nature, but I can't imagine humans going back to living in trees and communicating only as far as their voices can carry. In lots of ways, I would love to be like that. Maybe we could use one language of thought which could go anywhere in the world. Maybe my space travel theory would allow to travel anywhere in the universe and learn from other species who have already evolved. Then, if they have spaceships, they must have technology so have escape challenge in nature. I suppose it's best to take one thing at a time and see how we cope. <laughs> the two deja vus, 5th of June, 97. The deja vu is the most common of any mystical feeling, and these days are discarded as a malfunction. This so-called fact is made because they think they know what happens in the brain when this occurs. Something has to cause that, and so on. If you can watch what you are thinking about when déjà vu occurs, you will notice it has a meaning. When I first experienced finding a meaning for déjà vu, it was a double one, like three quick clips of the déjà vu feeling. It made me realise that I had to get up and do something that I wouldn't normally do in the position. I did, and it turned out very well that I did. It may have delayed my trip to Africa if I had ignored it. It is only recently that I have become aware to the conclusion of there being two types of déjà vu. 
whose meanings are opposite. I had known for a while that there are two types, but never put two and two together, until the other day my best friend Carl came round, unexpectedly as usual. We were talking about something important to me, and he helped me a lot. I rarely see Carl, so when I do, we always seem to help each other a lot with mentality. Pondering on the deja vu afterwards, I had thought at the time to find something I wouldn't normally do. It wasn't anything suitable, but I did notice how it was fate that Carl turned up. I can say not all about my situation at the time. It is too much to write, just a lot going on. The deja vu lasted about a quarter of a minute, but a nice continuance feeling, as the other is short, sharp and not so nice. With the long one, you smile and shout, deja vu. The other one, you might not say and look glum. Long one means you have may have a landmark in your life, and a good one. Short one says you are going down the wrong track, and you need to change. Last chance. Stephen Hartley's Life Hypothesis. Behind My Eyelids, June 9th, 1997 When I look behind my eyelids, I can sometimes see lots of faces, like looking at the clouds and as they change new faces appear. A cloud will often have a face because of its bleakness, but complexity, as will carpet, trees far and far away, etc. Behind the eyelids has the qualities more than anything else, and is more from your mind, but harder to find. Most of the faces I see day to day are strangers to me, but often when a particular person is on my mind, their face can come up, and the detail will show a very clear emotion, along with your thought. I am not sure if the person in your head receives anything consciously, but I would say subconsciously they would certainly know. I fear this mind function can be used for evil, and would be the evil ones to torment. If you are constantly calling someone, you are invading someone's privacy. I think I did this when I was first discovering that I could find someone, and from what I saw it told me I was causing harm. If you wait for the face to come to you, then it is good even though the other might not be aware. This function can harm. This is a type of telepathy. What you can gain from it using only good is the reaction to a soul towards you at a particular time. When I say soul, I am talking about the person without the conscious wall that is built over time. What you are doing is very necessary, as, is, as it is what others' reaction is about. What an evil person could gain using the wrong way is exactly what you don't want to know, your fears. With these, and also being in contact with you, an evil person could fuck you up, and you would think that they have been helping you all the time. You will only have hunches. You couldn't prove it to anyone. You may think it is only a hunch, but you actually know. Insanity or genius? There is a fine line between the two state of mind and they come out opposites. As with a lot of crucial decisions, moments, there is a junction and you have to take the right road. I believe an insane person has not only been a, has not been able to cope with who they are. Committing suicide is an insane act. A genius will have coped with who he, he is at the risk of becoming insane. The more genius he is, the harder it is to cope with the possibility of being insane. A genius may have to shut people out of what he is, so as not to get judged by Bison and knock his faith, his insanity. Only when he proves it, which is probably his aim, can he be comforted by others who will then believe it and keep genius sanity more intact. The road along can be hard. 
But it is one everybody will take, genius or not. Everybody needs recognition. Some just choose harder aims than others. You cannot be born a genius. You have to develop a genial way of thinking. Only then would you be classified as a genius. Everybody will at some time choose their road by feeling it is the right road for them. I have chosen mine this way because of the road it is. I do have an escape or two that I would be content with only after I've tried 100% though. I am taking this road because I believe it is my destiny. If I were to view what I truly believed, I might be or am, then I'd have odds of one in a billion. This is why every part is a secret until I have achieved it, and I am not even aware of what lies ahead, only my next step and towards a good in the fog, a goal in the fog. I know there is a goal and its shape, when I'm not too... When I'm not busy keeping faith, it's because I'm fighting for sanity and knowing myself. Yes, Huffley. <laughs> Particles in the air, 16th of the 8th, 98. Big gap. What is special about our world? What is it? that has sparked life to live and perform the miracle of our existence. As one example, the particles in the air from a pine tree that we can smell as it feeds the brain produces a memory from long ago. Smells can be become very specific indeed, thus giving almost infinite range of memories to remember. Particles in the air from a mountainside that have fired into the face of a person by a 40 mile an hour wind that cleanse and clean to give healthy skin and healthy blood. Particles in the air from a fresh mountain lake that are inhaled by a person invigorating the whole body. All these particles work together, all the time, and are absolutely free. You can't put your finger on any. Why should you want to? If you thought these statements I made were true, you could scientifically separate them and market them and make money, but it wouldn't work would spoil the whole purpose. Society today has achieved many things and does a good job keeping so many people reasonably happy. However, they are beginning to forget that quality of life isn't just how successful you are and they'll lose touch with the importance of the wild world. Well, that concludes the Blue Book. Um, just let you know that I uh, did go to the army, went to the Norwegian army. So I did go for the substitute, didn't get the real thing. <laughs> but yeah, so that was that stage in my life. You know the most recent bit, if you listen to my YouTube videos. And you know not much about the being between, but that was a failed marriage. So that's my life laid out for all to see. Thanks. Bye.